heard a great story about a young man from a just kind of very nominally Catholic background, and he really wanted a bicycle. And he tried all the normal means to get a bicycle. He got himself a little part-time job, and every time he'd go to the candy store, he had a hard time saving up enough money. So he had heard along the way that you pray, and God answers your prayer. And he'd never really done that before. So he figured, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll go check out the people on television so I learn how to pray. So he watched a television program, and... His prayer went something like, Thou sovereign Lord, if it be thine good pleasure and in accordance with thine providence, may I please have a bicycle? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. And a couple weeks later, no bike. So he's like, Well, Maybe I should check out another program. So he watched another religious program and came back and he prayed something like, I declare in the name of Jesus, as a child of the Most High God, I want the best bike in red. As a child of the King, I claim it as my inheritance in your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Sure enough, a couple weeks later, no bike. And at this point, his mother notices him in the family dining room. And he's got a backpack. And he's kind of just looking around. And then all of a sudden, he runs out of the door and the mother thinks to herself, what is he doing? And she goes into the dining room and of course, there on the, the, the furniture there, there, was a, there used to be a statue of Mary. And there was a note there. And when she opened the note, it said, Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again, I want a bike. <laughs> he decided to pull a Fusco version, I think. Now, it's a great story, but there's something that I want to bring out of the story, and that prayer is a confusing thing sometimes, isn't it? How does it work? How do we do it? Why is it there? When you put it in under the umbrella of our series that we're doing here in the book of Ephesians called Life is Messy. See, the reality is, is life is messy. Some of us want bicycles. There's nothing wrong with a bicycle. It's morally neutral. Some of us just want to pay our bills. Some of us would love a companion to walk through life with. Last week, we saw the God of the mess. We saw that our, even our understanding of God is messy this side of eternity because God is infinite and we are finite. As a family of faith here at Crossroads, we realize that we're all learning and growing about who God is. We have his word, we have his spirit, but we're all gro getting grown up. And we give each other the room to, to be in process. But from there in the book of Ephesians, now the apostle Paul moves to the idea of prayer. He prays for the church in Ephesus, which I'm calling prayer for the mess. Because in the midst of a messy life, God wants us to seek and understand him. So I want you to open up in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. As we continue this series called Life is Messy, we're going to be taking the second half of this chapter, picking up in verse 15. So if you're new to the Bible, the book of Ephesians, if you don't even have a Bible, there's Bibles in the pews in front of you, unless you're um, the absolutely wild people who like to sit in the first row. Uh, I, we call those the spitting rows, where I'm from, the spitting rows. Then you have the Bibles under your seat. But the book of Ephesians is in the last about quarter of your Bible. So the New Testament begins with the four Gospels, the last quarter of your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then you have the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And then you have, of course, the letters of Paul. And Ephesians is about the fourth one 
in line there, right in between the book of Galatians and Philippians. So we're chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read the Apostle Paul's prayer as he is speaking to the church in Ephesus, picking up in verse 15. It says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Everything we're going to talk about today as we walk through this passage of scripture is all going to be about the reality that although life is messy, there is a God who can be fellowshipped with. It's unique. That we talk to people, but we pray to God. I don't, I don't think that's by chance. We give God and our relationship with God, the discussion, the dialogue that happens. We give that its own word. It's not like any other relationship. It's unique. We call it prayer. And I'm here to tell you that your life is too messy not to pray. Your life is too messy not to pray. Because in prayer is when the heart of God is understood. The old hymn says something like, behind a frowning providence, there is a smiling face. What that's saying is that when everything's going wrong, God is still at work and good. But what happens when all of our circumstances go wrong, if you just connect the dots on the circumstances, you say, well, everything must be bad. God must be evil, wrong. But the thing is, is nobody ever spends the time to say, God, what are you up to right now? What are you doing? How does this work? And what you find if you are a person who finds that place to pray in the mess, you find that oftentimes God uses the most horrendous circumstances and brings beauty out of them. It's like the person who says, pray that I be humbled. I always say, you don't want to pray that prayer. Because when you ask God to humble you, then God brings out situations that are humbling. And nobody enjoys those situations. What I've learned is that the things that I really want deep in my heart, God actually gives me, just never in the ways that I want them. We want humility without struggle. We want faith without actually ever having to exercise it. We want love, but only for lovable people. We say, Lord, make me more loving, and then God surrounds us with people who are hard to love. See, we want the fruit without the growth. We want the benefits without the process that changes us forever. And so when we learn how to pray in the mess, God begins to bestow upon us a vantage point of our lives that are completely different than what we would get just by connecting the dots, so to speak, of our circumstances. And so the Apostle Paul, in church, talking to the church in Ephesus, he begins in verse 15, therefore, and you guys all know you've been at Crossroads long enough. You see, therefore, you say, what's it there for? That's right. Bible, Bible Interpretation 101. Therefore is a concluding sentence. And so last week we saw 
God the Father who elects in eternity past. We see God the Son who redeems in history past. And we see God the Holy Spirit who seals in the present moment. Because of that, therefore, look what he says. I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. The Apostle Paul saying, I've heard about you guys, so I do not cease to pray for you. And here, here's the lesson out of this. Pray when things are good. Pray when things are good. Prayer is a discipline. It's a muscle that we get used to using. For most people, they begin praying when the situation is dire. It's like you're going to run a marathon and you never train. You just, okay, it's marathon day. Let's go run. 26 miles or whatever it is you could tell them I'm not a runner. It's not my thing But you train long before you run the race We need to pray when things are good We need to build into that relationship when everything is well You notice the church in Ephesus. It's not like I've been praying for you because you guys are totally mangled The word your church is a mess. You guys are a mess. He doesn't say that he says, when I heard, this is beautiful, of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the church, your love for all the saints. The church in Ephesus loved God and loved people. They fulfilled the greatest commandment. Remember Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. This church is doing that. They got it going on. The main thing is the main thing. They love God they believe in Jesus. They love each other, the saints. And he says, look, you guys are believing in Jesus. You're loving on each other. And therefore, I don't cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. Now listen, I realize that some of you, right now, you're starting to pray for the first time because everything is a mess. And in that case, listen, I'm not saying that you should not pray when things are bad. I realize that when people hit rock bottom, oftentimes they come to Jesus. Why? Because they realize that they can't handle what's going on. They need something greater. People say, it's a crutch. I remember when I first got saved, people were like, well, I mean, come on, Daniel, you know that's a crutch. I'm like, yeah, but you need a crutch when you've got a broken leg. It's not wrong to lean on a crutch when you have a broken life. And the beauty is, is I didn't just get saved and lean on a crutch because I had a broken leg at the moment. I realized I have a broken life. And Jesus is my wheelchair. I can't make it without him. I don't want to pretend. There's nothing worse, though, when you have two broken legs and you're trying to walk around on your own. That just hurts you and everybody else around you. So I know some people say, oh, yeah, life's going bad, so you're reaching out for the crutch. That's religion. I'm here to tell you that when you have a broken life, only a crutch will do. Only a crutch will do. When your life, when you realize that left up to our own devices, we make a good royal mess of our lives, we say, I don't want, I don't want to drive this car. I want the Lord to. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you're here today, or you're watching online, or you're in the chapel, and you're just like, look, I'm learning how to pray because everything's a mess, don't think ill of that. I'm not trying to talk down on that. But we learn how to pray when things are good. A relationship is forged in the good times that will sustain us in the tough times. This church is doing well. They're praiseworthy. Paul's thanking God. And I want to encourage you that in the mess, it's always good to develop that prayer life before it's that moment of dire need. So if you're in a time when it's not total calamity, you have some breathing room, so to speak, I want to encourage you to pray in the midst of that. Everything is going, Lord, my marriage is doing great. Thank you, Lord. I want to go deeper. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better wife. My finances are not a total calamity, Lord. Thank you. Help me to be a good steward of the things that you've given me. Lord, I like my job. Will you let me be a blessing where I am? Or Lord, as I step on into this season of my life where I don't have to work every day, Lord, will you let me be a good steward of all this time and all this energy that I may be useful for your kingdom and your glory? The, we want to learn how to pray when things are good because then when things get bad, we are already dialed in. We have a lot of questions, but that relationship is solid is solid. So pray when things are good. Now, I also want you to notice in verse 16, Paul says, 
I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. You notice that prayer and praise are together for Paul. He doesn't have, I praise when the music is on, and then I pray in my prayer closet. He gives thanks and he prays together. And I want to encourage you, keep your prayer and your praise together. When you're in your, the quietness of your prayer closet, it's a great time just to say, God, you rock. You're the most awesome God in the world. The only God. Oftentimes we get so busy on our shopping list, which isn't bad, but we forget just to say, you're awesome. It's like, for those of you who are married, I'm constantly learning. I need to remind my wife that I believe that she's all that in a bag of chips. Sometimes just by my actions, I assume that she realizes that. But all you wives are like, no, no, don't assume that, right? So I need to say, before I say, wow, this is a great meal, I want to say, sweetheart, you are so awesome. Thank you for cooking for me. Thank you for being my companion, the love of my life, the person that I walk through life with. See, put your praise and your prayer together. Because a lot of us know what it's like. You come home and your spouse is like, I need the laundry done. You didn't clean the bathroom. You spent all the money in the ATM without ever saying thank you for that we share a bank account. What a novel concept. So put your prayer and your praise together. Put it together. The Apostle Paul does. Then in verse 17, he says, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Next, we want to pray for revelation. Pray for revelation. Pray for understanding and revelation. Paul is really praying that the church in Ephesus may be fully endowed with the Holy Spirit. He wants them to have all the benefits that have already been entrusted to them in the Spirit to be at work in their lives. And we have these three clauses. May give you, that God may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. I love this. Paul's prayer is that they may understand, that they may know, that they may have wisdom. And it's interesting. We live in a culture and a society that is long on information but short on wisdom. And if you don't believe that, just look at any article on the internet with a comment section. You learn more about our culture by reading the comment section. And it could be an article on anything. Politics, economics, Sports, I mean, there's a lot of people with a lot of information. You're like, does anybody have any good answers for the issues that are illing and, and messing up our world? We live in a culture exceedingly educated, but short on true wisdom. A wisdom that pervades just a cultural moment. Paul's saying, look, pr pray for revelation. He wants the church in Ephesus to truly have a spirit of wisdom, revelation in the knowledge of him. This, the idea of the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Literally in the Greek, it's the eyes of your heart. Think about your heart. The, the heart in our culture, as in Greek culture, in the, in the Hebrew culture, it was the bowels. Now, when we think of bowels, we think of something completely different. But in their culture, the bowels was the equivalent to the heart. It's the control center of the human life. It's the place where all of the information from your body, from your emotions, from your thoughts, and from God come together and decisions are made. So he's saying that the eyes of your heart may be given light. Oftentimes, we run to a lot of people for wisdom rather than one to the one person to whom wisdom is the default and resides. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have counselors. We know the Bible says there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. But the great counselor is God himself, the Almighty One. And we need to pray for revelation. That idea of revelation, it, it's the Greek word apocalypsis. And you guys have heard me say this before. When you think of the word apocalypse, you think of the end of the world. But apocalypse literally means the revealing, the unveiling. It means to open up a present and see what's inside. So the book of Revelation is not primarily about 
the mark of the beast and attack helicopters and plagues and stuff. It's the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is a book about Jesus. It's about his lordship and his reign and the rebellion of the world. So all these things are in there, but it's not the main point. So he's like, look, you want to have revelation, the unpacking, the unveiling, the looking inside the presence of who God is, that God will reveal himself to and in us. The most essential relationship we get to have in this world is a relationship with God. And the Apostle Paul is saying, look, you want wisdom. You want understanding. You want revelation. And you know what? We do, don't we? Nobody ever got to the end of their days and said, I spent too much time learning about who God was. Have you ever met somebody at the end of the day and said, yeah, I wish I didn't spend so much time fellowshipping with the Almighty God. They asked Billy Graham a couple of years back if there's anything he regrets. And he said, yeah, I regret that I didn't pray as much as I could have. When was the last time you ordered your life based on all the things you wanted people to remember and know about you and talk about on your deathbed and then work its way back? Most often we just react to life rather than saying, this is who I want to be remembered as. This is my legacy. Because you know what's amazing? On my deathbed, I'm not going to be excited that I have seen reruns of every single episode of Criminal Minds. Now, I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm putting my stuff out there for you. I, I mean, that's I on television. It's on reruns. And it's a cool show. But sometimes I sit there and watch it. I think, you know what? When I get to the end of my days, I'm not going to be like, yeah, Lord. I knew every single episode. I was like a, almost an agent in the behavioral analysis unit from my understanding of that TV show. Like, I just see I can profile you. Yeah, you know. It's, it's entertainment. And there's nothing wrong with entertainment, but at, at your deathbed, I'm like, yeah, man, he was an expert on Criminal Minds, some TV show that they discontinued about 30 years ago, Lord willing. <laughs> but if you think at the end of my days, I want to be remembered as a person who knew God, who was light in the world, who actually made, was an ordinary person who made a substantial dent in making this world a better place in Jesus' name. If that's how you want to be remembered, then you need to dial it back and say, this is how I'm going to live today. Because you never get there without having a vision to be there. I think about these athletes, and it's just amazing to me, the things they put their bodies through. You know, it's like, they don't do the things that the average person does because they can't, because they're training for something. We all make trades in life. And that's why I believe this prayer for revelation is so important. We need to say, Lord, this, I need to know what you see my life as, how you want to use my life, not how I'm just letting it flow. We are not just going along with the current of life. We are choosing to go along with the current of life. And you can branch off at any time. So we need that revelation for the Lord to say, this is who I want you to be. This is how I want you to be. This is how I want you to impact the world. This is what I want you to lay down and what I want you to enjoy, just not so much or not with so much energy or so many resources. We need to pray for that revelation that we may know him and be conformed into his image. Now, look what happens in the middle of verse 18. There's this prayer for wisdom, revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of our hearts being enlightened, having light to it. And then he says, notice, that you may know, the middle of verse 18, what is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? So here we're, we need to know the hope, the riches, and the power of Jesus. Know the hope, the riches, and the power of Jesus. There's three clauses here. Paul wants them to have wisdom and understanding and revelation that they may know these three things, hope, riches, and power. That you may know the hope of his calling. Think about that. God wants each one of us to know why we've been called and adopted. What's it all about? What the purpose of your life is? 
And I'm here to tell you the purpose of your life is not just to get educated, get a job, make enough to retire, and then go home to be with the Lord. That might be some parts of life, but that is not the purpose of your life. You are not just another on an assembly line of humanity with no reason for being here. There's a hope in our calling. It reminds us of Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Now catch this. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, God's calling, the hope of his calling is that God's going to place Jesus by his spirit in our lives and it's going to be worked out, permeating through an entire culture, an entire world. God's design for you and me is that Jesus, his perfect resurrected life will be lived through you as a homemaker or as a president of a company, as a teacher or as a sanitation worker, as, as, a, as an investment banker, or as a land developer, and as a middle school and high school student, and everything in between. Jesus, in us, by his spirit, moving through the world, making the world a better place, and giving God glory the whole time. That's the hope of the calling. The hope of his calling is that God dwells in us and through us. But not only that, not only do we need to know the hope, this next clause is pretty awesome, the end of verse 18. That you may know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Think about what that says. That God has riches of glory in his inheritance in the saints. Do you know what that means? God's church, the people of God, God sees that as a rich inheritance. That changes the way we view church. It should. Look around this room. I want you to look at the person next to you and say, you're golden. Say, I mean, and mean it. You're golden. Look at the person next to you and say, you're silver. You're God's riches and glory as an inheritance. When God looks at the people of God, he thinks, I have been totally hooked up with the most profound inheritance. Now imagine you've got a rich inheritance. Everyone's like, uh, amen, Pastor Daniel, from your mouth to God's ears. God sees his people as the, a multi-billion dollar inheritance times infinity. God's inheritance is people, not stuff. Not just things that moth and rust can destroy, but people, living, breathing, human souls. Talk about an identity builder. God sees you as a rich inheritance, but not us as individuals, us as a corporate organism, the people of God. I remember when I first got saved, I had a low view of church. I'm like, oh, you know, those church people, sinners. You know what's funny? I still feel the same way. Because you're all sinners and so am I. But God looks at us as broken sinners and says, that's my inheritance. I'm loaded. God sees the church not as a throwaway organization, something I just join every once in a while because I'm bored and I need some friendships. God sees the church as his inheritance in Jesus. So the next time you want to get negative on the church, and all of our culture will tell you how lousy the church is, we need to remember this verse. That this is the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. Next time we have interpersonal conflicts amongst the body of Christ, and guess what? We always do. We always will. We're all porcupines. We all got little things, and we just poke each other from time to time. We have to remember that it's not about just, oh, I've got to find a better church. We are the riches of glory of his inheritance god values you that much not only as individuals but together but not only the hope and the riches of verse 19 and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power 
Do you realize that there is an extraordinary power at work in our hearts in Christ? Do you realize that everything you need for life and godliness is not found in a new job or a new spouse or a new set of friends or the next book that's going to come out, even if one of your pastors were to write it? It's all there in Jesus for you. It's all there, all the power you need. Now, watch how he explains this power, because we move into verse 20. It says, at the end of verse 19, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. He's saying the power that's at work in us, his riches of his glory and the inheritance in the people is the resurrection power and the ascension power that he worked in Jesus. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead and had him ascend to return to his rightful place on the throne of God, that power is at work in us. Wow. Here, here's these two verses in two words for you. Jesus Supreme. This is all about Jesus Supreme. Now I know you guys hear Jesus Supreme, you think of Nacho Supreme, Burrito Supreme, and I'm hungry too. But Jesus is Supreme. The power that was at work in Jesus, that he lived the perfect life, that he died, and he was risen from the grave. Not only was he risen to die again, but he was ascended into heaven and seated down at the right hand of the Father. Now listen, you have to realize that this is Christianity 101, right there. You read the book of Acts, their message was Jesus lived, he died, he rose again, and he ascended into heaven. Now I realize that in Christianity in the 21st century, We've kind of gotten bored of that. So everyone wants to say the church is about something else. The primary message is something else. No, that is the gospel message. Whatever we do because of that is not the gospel message. That's the gospel. Who this man Jesus is and what he has done. Now listen, I realize there's many people in here, in this room, in one of our other venues, watching online, watching this on YouTube or some other form of media later on. The big question is, what have you done with Jesus? And if this man Jesus truly lived, truly died, truly rose again, and truly ascended into heaven, then you need to think about that. Because that reality changes everything. It's not enough to say, yeah, maybe he did, but what does that do for me? That does everything. Because when you put your faith and trust in God conquering sin and death that changes who you are that changes how you roll that changes why you roll the way you roll because there is the resurrection and ascension power of god at work in the depths of your soul changing you from the inside out see the you live based on what you believe you live based on what you value. Don't let anyone pretend like, oh, I just, I just am who I am. No, you have a theology, a set of beliefs about who God is, who I am, what I deserve or don't deserve. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus gives you no room for a passive view of him. Not for a logical person, not for a person who actually is saying, look, I'm really open you have no room for passivity with Jesus. He just, he holds you down. He's got you in a sleeper hole. And that's why most people try and pretend like they're not paying attention. I was that person, trying to like wiggle out the side. Oh yeah, I really don't do that religion thing and you know, spirituality, that'll blow over. Dude, deep down I was deeply religious like everybody else to the core of who I was. But Jesus is supreme. If Jesus is who he said he is, then we have to live in response to that. Each one of us are implored, it's an imperative to live in response to that. It's amazing. The death of Jesus was the supreme demonstration of God's love. 
and the resurrection of Jesus is the supreme demonstration of God's power. That's why I call this Jesus supreme. That death and that resurrection ascension, they supremely de demonstrate God's love and his power. And if you put your faith and trust in Jesus right now in this place, or if you already have and you're living in response to that, that same power is at work in you and in me and in all who would believe. Now, it's interesting. It talks about his ascension. And in verse 21, it says, Far above all the principalities and powers and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. What he's saying is that the ascension of Jesus, Jesus reigns supreme over everything. These principalities and powers and might and dominion. According to Hebrew culture and Hebrew beliefs, there were different rankings of the heavenly angels. And a lot of people, they read that, they just want to get into all the differences of the angels, and all that is speculative. The Bible doesn't tell us all that much, and some of us like to get into that stuff, because we dig the mystical stuff. But really, it has nothing to do with the angels saying, look, Jesus is supreme. That's what it's saying. Jesus is so far ahead of any demonic or angelic being. He is way above. And notice what it says. All these different gradations of angels, and then it even says, not only in this age, but also in that that's which to come. He's saying not only is Jesus supreme now, but always. So when, it, when push comes to shove, the person who is supreme in the universe is God, and God values his son that much. Far above everything. That's why it's Jesus supreme. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. The Apostle Paul says this, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's why I cannot encourage you enough to put your faith and trust in Jesus and then spend every single moment of your life simply responding to him. Because he's got a name above every name. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And every means every. It doesn't mean that, no, not me. I'm the one who's got the opt-out, get out of Jesus free card. It's not that way. Ultimately, every knee bows. And I'm like, look, if ultimately every knee is going to bow, then I'm going to do it right now. If he's the king, then I want to be on his team. If he's going to win the World Series, I'm putting all my money down on him. That's just smart. And not only is it smart, that will absolutely change your life. Everything you really want in life, you'll find in Jesus. Everything that you truly value, you will find not only in Jesus, but as the Spirit of God works through your life. Think about that. Jesus is supreme. That's what we learn in prayer in the midst of the mess. That there's a power at work in us. No matter how much calamity is part of our lives, the resurrection and ascension power of Jesus is at work in his people. Who is his inheritance? It's great power. And then notice verse 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. I'm going to close here. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up and help me finish out our message today. We learn in these verses that the church is the body and fullness of Jesus. The church is the body and fullness of Jesus. Notice, it says, God put all things under Jesus' feet. Now, that's a direct quote out of Psalm Chapter 8, verse 6. He put all things under feet. I want to encourage you later. Go read Psalm 8. It begins with the beautiful words, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And saying that everything has been put under the feet, the authority of Jesus. And then it says, and gave him to be the head over all things in the church. Now remember, we've been talking about the church being this inheritance of glory and riches that God has in us. The people of God. Church is not a building. 
It's a group of people. It's you and I and all who would believe. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the source. He is the one who leads the church. One scholar, Kenneth Weiss, says it this way. The church is not merely an institution ruled by Jesus as president, a kingdom in which he is a supreme authority, or a vast company of men of moral sympathy with him. Listen to this. But the church is a society with, is in, which is in vital connection with him, having the source of its life in him, sustained and directed by his power, the instrument also by which he works. He's our head. We get our life. He's our source. We are the vehicle through whom he works. Notice, because he says that he's our head, then he says, which is his body. The church is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. You see, the church is the body and the fullness of Jesus. Do you realize that because of your faith in Jesus, that not only are you the hands and feet of Jesus in the world, he's the head, he directs it all. We find our life in him, but we're also the fullness of Jesus in the world. That's why it's been said that the church is the only hope for humanity. Because God loves to move through you and me. That's why Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. If he's the head and we're his body, if we are his fullness in the world, then brothers and sisters, we need the Holy Spirit to be that. It changes your life when you realize that you are not only a husband, a wife, a son or a daughter, a employer, an employee, a Republican or a Democrat, a Seahawks fan or a Niners fan or whatever. We are those things, but we are so much more than that. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. You are the fullness of Christ in the world today. Brothers and sisters, we need to be in love and on mission as his body, as his people. And for some of us, you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus today. You want to be part of this inheritance. You want your sins forgiven. You want that power, the the power of the resurrection and the ascension to be at work in your life. And if you've already made that decision, you need to say, Lord, I want to be that afresh today. I want to be your body. Lord, let me be your pinky finger. Let me be your little toe. Some of you have gumption, like, Lord, let me be your thumb and your big toe. We need to be the hands and feet in the world of Jesus. The world needs us to be that. Because when we are his hands and feet, God gets glory and the world gets blessed. And if there's one thing we need, maybe more than ever, is for the people of God to stand up and say, I'm with Jesus and I want to bless the world in his name. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts and pray. Father, we thank you so much for the prayer in the mess. And Lord, we want more than anything to be your people, to be your body, to be the fullness of Christ in this world. Because Jesus is supreme. He has all authority. He gets all the glory. And Father, we want to know that hope of the calling. We want to know the riches of the inheritance and the people of God. We want to know that power, that exceeding great power that was at work in Jesus, that we want to be at work in our midst in all of its resplendent glory. Lord, we want revelation today. We want wisdom. We want the eyes of our hearts enlightened. We want revelation and the knowledge of who you are. And Father, teach us how to pray when things are good. We want to be like the church in Ephesus, loving you, Lord, and loving one another. Lord, will you bless us with that? Lord, in the messes that are our lives, teach us to pray in the mess and to praise in the mess. And we thank you for that love and that grace. As we continue to pray together, there are some in here today, you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. 
And right now is that time for you. You want to be part of that inheritance. You want the power that resurrected Jesus from the dead to be at work in you and through you. You want to, by your own decision, say, I'm bowing my knee to Jesus today. I'm giving my life to He who is supreme today. If that's you, if you feel God moving on your heart, I want you to take a few steps of faith with me. I just want you to raise your hand to start off. You're just saying yes to Jesus. Don't be scared. You're just saying, yes, I want, I want all that's in Christ to be a part of my life. Raise your hand up high. It's a big room. It's hard to see. So just say yes to Jesus here this morning. Say yes to Him. God bless you. I see you over there on my left. Keep that hand up. Other people saying yes to Jesus here today. 